I hate when my husband works late, being at home, alone at night, hearing every little creak. It's uncomfortable. I thought I was just being paranoid. Then my girlfriend said she felt the same way when her husband travels. Until they had what she calls their Vivint talk. Vivint, my friend calls it the best home security system out there. It's super easy to use and fit right into our budget. And I love my video cameras. I can see what's going on in and around my home right from my computer or smartphone. It's actually kind of funny. I told my husband, if you're going to be traveling or working late, I'm getting Vivint. And it's made all the difference. Call now. Not only is installation free, you'll get up to $1,500 worth of Vivint security cameras and equipment today at no charge. Seriously, $1,500. Just pay as little as $99 for activation. Call 877-776-3430-877-776-3430-877-776-3430. Restrictions apply. 48 or 60 month agreement at minimum $49.99 per month required. Not available in Louisiana. See Vivid.com for license numbers. Blog Talk Radio. Thank you for tuning into the Herpetological Hour here on Dakota Network. If you would like to speak to the guest or ask a question or just plain share a great story you have, please feel free to call us at 1 718. 766-4119. Thank you and enjoy the show. Thank you for tuning in to the... Uh, Thank you for tuning in, everybody. Uh, Today I got uh, Scott McFarlane on the... the, uh, on the show, he's going to talk a little bit about his reptiles that he's got. He breeds, uh, as almost everybody knows, Florida king snakes, and uh, he also breeds uh, some ball pythons. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest, Scott. Scott, how are you today? Good. How are you doing, Andrew? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. So, uh, anything new going on at your facility down there? I got a lot of breeding going on. Been a heavy couple of weeks. I've had 20 lockups in the past month and uh, actually starting to have eggs come. So it's fixing to start getting really busy around here. Yeah, that's what I enjoy about it is the when the eggs come and then, all, then the next big thing is when they all start pip it, start to pip. It, it gets very interesting around that time of year. Yeah, there's always <clears throat> steps of excitement. It's fun when they breed and it's fun when they're laying eggs and trying to catch all the timing so you get to see everything going on. It's it's an exciting pro- project to do. Uh, and you also breed ball pythons too, is that correct? Yeah, I have ball pythons too. Anything interesting going on with those? Or... Because I, I don't see um, ball pythons. So I don't know. Well, the ball python projects, me and my mother and my daughter and mainly my mother that enjoys them and she studies up on all the genetics of them which are pretty crazy with codoms and the recessives and genes that make supers and it's kind of a little confusing to me because it's easy for me just to understand the recessive genetics but there's so much going on with ball pythons probably more than corn snakes ever was but it's a fun project it's a family thing that you know, I do with my mom, and we're part of it together. And she's into uh, stuff that's really rare or not so common. Like she likes the highway stuff, and she's trying to do like panda pods and anything with pods. She's doing. She's got some bananas, and she's mixing up all kind of stuff that is really past me with what I'm doing with the king snakes. <laughs> <laughs> now. Do you have a problem with the cycling with those, considering do you keep them with in the same room as your uh, king snakes or anything? No, do you have actually, any problem with the... The snakes are out in a deep... But king snakes are out in a detached building, and the ball pythons actually get to live in a house, so they got their own bedroom. And uh, they're similar, similarly climate-controlled, and... Uh, she, she just pays attention to how they cycle, and when she could see that they're ovulating, that's when we put them together. And the ball pythons breed 
like year round versus how I breed my Florida Kings. I just let nature take its course. So I breed them during the springtime when they're naturally breeding. So it's easy for me. And with the ball pythons, you kind of got to pay attention to them a little bit and catch them when they're ovulating, unless you have a sonogram, which I don't. It's easier to tell when there's follicles then. Yeah. Now, now where you live at, there, it, it's easier to do the uh, Florida king snakes, but uh, do you have to do any real cycling with them to get them to breed at all, or do you just, like, open windows and let the temperature change on its own and stuff like that? Yeah, I let the outside natural ambient temperatures kind of run it. Like, when it's hot during the summer, I run a big air conditioner, and I keep it between 80 and 84 degrees, depending on how hot a day it is. Sometimes it's out of hand for me with the air conditioner trying to keep up when it's super hot outside. But uh, when it's cold out, I'll run the heater so it doesn't get in the 40s or anything. But I'll let it get down in the 50s and 60s. And that's usually only for the timeline of when it's cold out. Sometimes it's cold for weeks, and sometimes you get a couple days of cold, and then it's warm again and a couple days of cold. But I let them cycle through it just as if they were in the wild, and I haven't had any issues with snakes not wanting to breed. It seems like once one or two of them start ovulating, it seems like everybody else can smell it, and I don't know if it triggers them, but they all seem to cycle at the same time. Maybe it's like, a couple of women that live in the same house and they all cycle at the same time. Maybe it's something like that. Yeah. I, I was going to ask you if, uh, if you, if you thought that, uh, like getting a couple of them to breed triggers the rest, because I know they release, uh, pheromones and stuff like that. I'm sure that, that, uh, this is my opinion. I'm not sure if what you think, but I think that it triggers a bunch of them to just go right down the line and start breeding. Do you, do you think that I agree really happens with you too? Yeah. Cause I mean, it, with so many snakes in one room, you can almost smell the pheromones. When the males are breeding the females, you can smell the musky smell from them. And the males all start going bananas. As soon as I get one or two females to ovulate, all the males start running wild like they're starving animals. They go crazy in the cages probably for two months. So have you ever had a problem with uh, – I've seen some breeders. I've never had this problem, but – have you ever had a problem with uh, one trying to eat the other one? Because I know some – I've seen pictures of it, but I've never had the problem. I've never I, crossed it. I do have one pair that they're a little on the young side. They're only about 30 inches, and I introduced them this year for the first time, really just as an introduction, just to see how they react to each other and let them get used to each other a little bit. And in three seconds, the female wrapped up the male – so then it was like trying to untangle a knotted up extension cord. <laughs> so, but that's the only time that I've ever had an issue. I'm really comfortable with leaving my snakes together. I, I feed them up real well and then I put them together and I leave them together three, four days. Some of them stay together for two, three months at a time. I only separate them during the summer when I'm feeding so often it's easier to not have to separate them all the time because I do separate them when I feed them. I don't feed them together because sometimes they grab the same mouse and I just, to prevent any incident, I don't feed them together. Some people are comfortable with it, but I feel if you don't pay attention to them, you can have an issue, but I've only yeah. had one issue breeding them where they, the female wrapped the male and really didn't fight me too hard to separate them. And they haven't been back together yet because I think they're a little young and she's got a real aggressive food drive. So she'll eat anything, including a finger, if it goes in her cage. Yeah, some have a real strong feeding response. Um, yeah, they're Florida kings. Most of them do. Yeah. Uh, do you have a um, – do you, do you, do you, where do you think uh, – the morphs and stuff are going to be going with the Florida Kings. Do you think they're going to keep coming up with new ones or do you think there's like a limit? Like the corn snakes are just way out there and same like the ball pythons. I mean, with ball pythons, they say there's like a thousand morphs or something and there's like 2000 more to go or something just with what they have. So do you feel that the Florida King snake is going to catch up to that? Cause it, out of all the King snakes, I would say that they got 
uh, one of the largest variety of color or paint jobs to go um, with them. Yeah, I don't know. Um, with the way some of these guys work with them and with line breeding, there's no way to tell of what can pop out, what the future can hold. I mean, there's definitely a possibility for new things to pop out. But, uh, I mean, I think I'm happy with what there is, so if nothing ever does, I'm satisfied with what there is because combinations are so versatile now. I guess with the, the patternings that are coming and stuff, and, yeah, there's going to be a lot of new things coming out. I'm sure there is. Yeah. Um, like like I ordered from you during the summer here, and I was just amazed at – I mean, not during the summer, but a few months back. I was just amazed at the, the quality of your animals. Out of all the stuff I've ordered I, over the years, you, you, it's like you've taken the extra step to make sure that these animals are healthy – uh, they're clean looking. They're they're just. It's just. I was just amazed. Just amazed. Yeah, well, I'm not excited. trying to mass produce them, and I try to. I put in that extra effort, and I think it shows in them where I put that little bit of pride in there. And sometimes it only takes a little bit more effort just to make the difference. And you know, I guess with somebody being a big breeder, it would be easy to skip some small things that. I think little things make the difference. So I always try to put in a little extra and make sure I take care of everything that's going on, make sure that there's always fresh water, make sure I feed on a re regular schedule. Some of them get fed more often than others because some snakes, they soak the mice up faster. They digest them and they're through it. They have a higher metabolism, so they're like a snake that moves around the cage all the time is going to burn up more energy than something that just lays in the corner. So some require more feed, and I just try to be attentive to even small things like that and give those snakes the extra feed that they would require so they don't end up getting skinnier to the small things, make sure everything's clean. Yeah, that then that's what makes a good breeder, someone who pays the pays that little bit of an extra attention to uh, the detail. Yeah, I would what's consider going. myself... I would consider myself like an extreme hobbyist more so than like a breeder. I do it because I really enjoy it. My kids love it. And the fascination of being able to make these morphs and mix them and then raise the hets and then have stuff pop out on hets that I've put together is just the reward is incredible. So uh, in your, in your King snake collection there, you mind me asking how many you have in your collection? I have 131 Florida king snakes at the present. So not a huge collection. collection, but yeah, I have a pretty good size collection. It's a little bit beyond just a hobby at this point, but I don't think I've had a switch. Happy not to even go there because I'm pretty much overwhelmed with the amount of time it takes me to take care of everything the way I want to take care of it. So I'm not looking to get much bigger than I really am. Yeah, I'm sure there are people listening that are like 130 snakes. You know, and they, they think that's a lot. And some of these big breeders have thousands, some of the bigger breeders. Yeah, and well, to I, do it I, by I, myself is different too. Yeah, and I think that's where you're buying from a smaller breeder uh, who think, takes it as a hobby and as a pastime like it seems like you do. It uh, You get better quality stuff too because – like you said, you take the extra moment to notice which ones need more food and things like that. <clears throat> yeah, I pay attention to each individual snake instead of having a $10 an hour guy that cleans cages for me and doesn't notice things or he's just rushing through it just to get his cages cleaned or anything. I go through and I look at every single snake when I feed. And when I feed, I usually I call it my poop collection time too, so... <laughs> I clean as I feed. Every time I open a tub, I try to make it as productive as possible. I inspect the tub, make sure the water's clean, make sure they didn't go to the bathroom in the bowl or whatnot, which are, to me, really simple husbandry things that any snake keeper should do. Just be attentive to your animals. That's what I do, and I don't. that's why I don't want to really become that 500 or 1,000 snake breeder because I think then you lose – it, then it's not a hobby. Then it becomes your job, and you lose heart for it, I think. 
where I still yeah. enjoy my animals. So, someone who, think, who is thinking about becoming a breeder, do you have any tips for them to make sure that they can produce this good quality uh, animal like you do? Probably the best tip I can give you is, one, be selective in what you're doing. Make sure it's something that you're going to enjoy. You know, don't breed with the thought that people like this piece, so I'm going to sell this type of snake. Breed what you like, because if there's no enjoyment in it, it's work. And it's a lot of work to maintain these animals properly. So if you don't love it, don't think that you're going to just jump in and make a bunch of money doing it because it's not like that. You have to love this hobby. Yes, I have to agree with you there. <clears throat> so where do you plan to take this hobby? Do you plan to get any bigger or do you plan to just stay where you're at or anything new on the horizon I'm probably for you? Gonna be, I'm probably going to have more snakes than I have now because I'm making heads. And I'm keeping a lot of those heads trying to produce different three and four gene snakes. So it requires me holding on to a reasonably large number of snakes. I'm going to try to stay less than three, four, five hundred snakes because the work is probably imaginable, unimaginable. And I want it to stay a pleasurable thing where I enjoy it because that's what I do. I enjoy it. I give my two days for the weekend and I spend a day and a half taking care of my animals. And then I have a half a day for the weekend to play. And every night when I get home from work, I spend a few hours with them and double check clean and whatnot. So it requires a lot of time. So trying to just be a big mass producer, not looking to go that way. Yeah. Uh, do you have any plans to do oh, getting a YouTube channel or anything like that? <clears throat> I have thought about it. I got a friend that is going to make me a web page. We've kicked around a couple ideas, but uh, yeah, we're working on a few of those things. The YouTube channel, we're talking about like when I build a rack system or something like that, just putting up like tips and tricks, you know, so it's been talked about. We've kicked it around and it's really a matter of finding the right person to film it and just make it so it's presented in a reasonably good manner instead of like when you go on YouTube and you see the 12 year old kid explaining to you how to sex a snake, you know, I just want it to look a little bit more professional and be educational to the point where it, it's a valuable piece. Yeah, I, I, I understand because you go to YouTube and there's a lot of stuff on there, but it's some of it uh, is very unprofessionally done. And uh, better quality stuff seems to trigger more people to pay attention and things like that. Uh, how, how Do your kids enjoy this hobby with you? Oh, yeah. My daughters, they love every part of it, down to breeding the mice and taking care of all that. My daughter's actually caught snakes on her own out in the backyard, some red rats, and bred them, and she hatched those out, and now she's raising babies that she hatched out two years ago and she's so looking forward to getting them to breed and having babies out of those too. She's just started collecting hog noses so now we're going to have a few hog noses around the house which are actually kind of cool snakes. I've never really paid too much attention to them because I've had the Florida king bug but now that I've been opened up my eyes to the hog nose I think they're kind of neat. They're, it's a fun it's a good pet snake yeah, I I enjoy the, the hog nose myself. Um, <clears throat> now, getting into like the mice, you say you breed your own mice. Yeah. Uh, do, do you do you do that in a separate building than your snakes, or do you do it in the same facility, or it's in the, in the same room? Okay. It's in the uh, same room, and the you... the mice. Go ahead. What was that? No, go ahead. What we... I didn't mean to cut you off. Well, I, when I breed the mice, they're in the same room, and the snake racks are halfway across the room, and then the mouse racks are on the opposite wall, 20 feet apart. So the room smells like mice all the time. Some people say that you can't do that because the snakes get used to smelling them. Well, I guess those people don't have Florida kings because I don't seem to have a problem with them smelling them and not wanting to eat. Yeah. I think maybe it might make them want to eat all the time because they want to eat all the time. 
<laughs> now, are, are these regular mice or are they the African sulfurs? No, I do regular mice, but a couple years ago we were at a Repticon show and my daughter saw some fancy mice with fancy colors and calicos and bright amber colors and shiny coats. So she had the, of course, daddy, I want. So we got, <laughs> and now <laughs> half of our, half of our mice are like designer looking mice. And I do breed regular whites, albinos too. I think they produce a little bit better than all the fancy one my daughter likes, but they produce enough that they're worth having and for the enjoyment that she gets out of mixing them up and like she breed, she'll put all the certain color gold one in a tub. So she'll start her own tubs of just gold ones and then colors of just the calico ones and ones that are just blue. She's got like a whole network of things. It's kind of funny to watch her. She's like the, <laughs> the long tailed hamster whisperer. I tell her <laughs> <laughs> at least, at least she enjoys it. I mean, some kids uh, don't e- wouldn't even think of even looking at a mouse or anything, or even a snake for that matter. And I find my daughter so also uh, really gets into it. She's always trying to bring friends over because she wants to take them and show them something. Do you get that yeah. a lot? Yeah, do yeah. You ever do- she's come over and they want to go in there and rifle through the drawers and look at all the snakes. And it always makes me nervous. I got to run out there and make sure that everybody's closing stuff properly. And fortunately, it's been good so far, but they really yeah, I, enjoy it. My daughter left one open, and it took me a couple of days to find it again. <laughs> yeah, well, when we change tubs out, it always seems to be one that drops out. So then I'm on my belly reaching up underneath all the racks trying to find the ones that escaped, which I guess that's just nature of the beast. Yeah. Especially when the kids any- are helping me. Do you ever do any educational stuff at the uh, schools with your, uh, with, for your children or anything? No, I don't yet, but I'm not opposed to it. If the opportunity came, I would gather a bunch of snakes up and uh, do any kind of educational thing that was presented to me. My friend Otter John does educational things, so if I needed any kind of educational stuff, I would have him involved with it. Yeah, we uh, I used my wife and I used to go up to the school up here. They had a teacher up here who used to do this uh, lesson on uh, snakes, and then once a year we would go up and do an educational thing. But a couple of years ago, she retired, and she, they don't do that program no more. So, but if they ever do, I'm sure we'll go back up and start uh, doing it again. Yeah, like I enjoy when the my kids' friends come over. I enjoy showing them, and usually. It's their parents want to come over and see them too. So then I'm doing the whole explanation to the whole family about how things are and what they are. And sometimes I get in a little deeper about, you know, just how to take care of the snakes and how these are non-venomous. And the reason why the kids can go through them the way they are is because they're just Florida Kings because they're always worried. Oh, are you worried about them biting you? Or, and then the classic, which ones are the poisonous ones? And, of course, yeah. everything is all non-venomous so the kids can play with them. It's not like I'm going to have a yeah. room full of cobras and my preteen children are playing with them. Yeah. It's funny how, how people automatically think of venomous as soon as they hear it's snake. Oh, mm. yeah. It's a classic. Um, Like I tell people all the time, they always go, can it bite me? Well, anything with a mouth can bite, so, but it won't. Yeah. It's not a big deal. <laughs> Yeah, it scares um, you more than it hurts you. It's a twitch reflex that makes you jump, but once you realize that you jumped for no reason and probably made a really loud girl noise, you're almost <laughs> embarrassed that you did it when you realize that didn't hurt at all. No. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Even some of us bigger, the adults jump. <laughs> yeah, they make so, me uh, jump sometimes. Now with your mice... Um, now, I was going to breed mice, but I would have to do it, you know, in my house, and I don't want to do that because I know they stink. Do you have any tricks to keeping the smell down? I've heard some people talk about, because i got a separate room, and they talk about their special fans you can get in there and stuff, because, you know, when you have to buy them all your, by, you know, separately, it can get pretty yeah. expensive, especially when you got a bigger collection. Yep. 
I mean, I use just regular kiln-dried pine shavings that I get from the feed store, but I also add uh, pine pellets to it, and I'm finding that the pine pellets seem to keep the aroma down every seven days. Every Friday is my change day. Sometimes by Friday, it's starting to stink a little bit, but uh, the really the key to the stink is how often you change it. If you were to do it in the house and had a smaller system where you only had to dump the tubs every other day and just add more shavings, you can keep it so it doesn't stink up the whole place. Yeah. But if you let it stretch four or five days, of course, you're going to get an odor. Yeah. 